So this is the second course in linear algebra. And as such, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking some familiar ground a lot of the time, especially today, of things that you already covered in linear algebra, your first course, intro linear algebra. But we're going to be trying to walk it from a little bit higher, higher perspective, right? So it's like maybe you're walking in the valley before, and now we're walking on a mountaintop, or whatever it might be. Same trail, but from a higher perspective. So what do I mean by this? What did you talk about the very first day of linear algebra, intro linear algebra, your first linear algebra course? What was the first day? After the syllabus and all that, what was the first topic you talked about? Vectors, right? But maybe not. I, I don't know how it's taught, but I think typically you began with vectors, right? Same with multi-available calculus. You began with these things called vectors. And, and so what are vectors? Let's, let's think about vectors. Well, we could just imagine vectors in a place like R2. And, and when you first learn about vectors, you, I don't know, what, what's some like layman's definition you're given of a vector? What are you told about vectors? Great, it has some magnitude, it has some direction, which says there's somewhere it's pointing and it goes so far, right? So, so here's some vector. I'm gonna give this the, the fancy name, you know, V, with a little, a little bar over it to indicate it's a vector. And, and this is a vector that just has two coordinates, some, some X coordinate and some Y coordinate, right? Where X and Y are real numbers, because it lives in R2, so there are two real values that comprise that vector. And the great thing is, there's not just one vector, you can have lots of vectors, right? Here's, here's a second vector. Here's a second vector. W. Where W also comprises some, some X value and some Y value. Oh, but now we're going to get in trouble, so maybe I should say, like, this is X1, Y1, and maybe this is, like, X2, Y2. Okay, so you come up with some name of naming your coordinates, and you have your vectors. Okay, so there are these creatures that live in R2. What kinds of things can you do to them? What is that? Add them. You can add them. Great. So here's V, here's W. How do you add these two vectors? Well, well the algebraic way is you just do x1 plus x2. That gives you x value. y1 plus y2. That's your y value. How about geometrically? How do we add them? Yeah, we move one to the end of the other one, right? So we just move that W over here. We're going to transport that W right here. I'm going to try and draw something that looks like W. And so it's like this whole idea of tail and head. And you just put this right there. And then you look, what is this new thing? Well, we can imagine there being some new vector now that goes from the origin to the end. And that new thing is what we're going to call V plus W. Yeah? But, but why did I put W at the end of V? What, what if I had instead put V at the end of W? Would that mess me up? No. no, you could instead move your V right here, and you get the exact same thing. So we're seeing that if you instead do your W plus your V, you get the exact same thing. And so then we'll say, oh, OK. So, so vectors can be added, and when you add them, they're commutative, right? So we're coming up with some properties that these vectors have. Anything else you can do to vectors? Scalar. Great. We can multiply by some scalar. So here's V. And, and maybe what we do is we, we grab some scalar. So we have these things called scalars that, that are just real values. So, so some C is maybe some scalar. And we're just going to multiply it by C. Maybe C is a number bigger than 1, like 1 1.5, which would just stretch this out however far. So here's now C times V. So we can scale our vectors. And then we can, we can ask, well, how do these operations play together? How do scaling relate to adding and these kinds of questions? So the way we begin an intro to linear algebra is we introduce these very concrete things called vectors in R2 or R3 or R whatever. And, and then we come up with properties of those vectors. What we want to do now is say, well, well, what if we forget the fact that these vectors actually live in R2? And instead, we're just going to define vectors to be any kind of thing that satisfies these same properties. OK? So, so here we go. Let's, let's list the properties. And then we're going to say, OK, and let's forget that they live in R2. And they let, let be anything that satisfies those properties. So I'm going to list the properties we have so far. 
So, so we started out with some vectors, which were our V and our W in R2. And, and we had a scalar that will come into play in a second. C inside of the real numbers. And then we started saying things like, well, when you, add, you can add two vectors to get another ve a vector. So, so that means that the vectors are closed under addition. V plus W is also a vector. Two, we said it doesn't matter the way you add it. You can do V plus W or W plus V. That means that this addition is commutative. So V plus W is W plus V. And not only is the addition commutative, it's also Associative, excellent. Associative meaning it doesn't matter how we group them. V plus W plus a third vector, let me introduce another one called U, will be the same as V plus W plus U. In, in this case, it's just like real numbers, right? You can add real numbers, get another real number. They commute, they associate. There's also a very special real number that when you add it to something, it does nothing. We call that number zero. And analogously, we have a zero vector. It's not very interesting, but if you add the zero vector to something, it leaves that thing the same. So let me add that as a property. There exists a zero vector. So that if you add it to any other vector, it stays the same. And now since we're talking about zero and addition, maybe we should talk about negatives or inverses. What do I need to add to this V to get to zero? Well, the thing that's just pointing in the opposite direction, yeah? This kind of creature over here, this, this thing that's opposite direction, same magnitude, we call that negative V. Why negative V? Because the coordinates of this guy are just negative X1 and negative Y1. So we should say that, we should say there exist these kinds of inverses, there exist these additive inverses. For every vector v, there exists some negative v, so they add up to the zero vector. And then we said it's not just about adding these vectors, but we can also scale the vectors. So our sixth property would be that we have these things called scalars, things that scale the vectors. So if we multiply some scalar by a vector, it's still a vector. It's still something in R2. Of course, we know how to do this in R2. To scale a vector by C, you just scale both of its coordinates by C. Okay, how does scalar play with addition? How, how, does, how does scaling play with your vector addition? We have a distributive law where it's just C times V plus C times W. And, and you can check this, right? You can check, well, if I scale both these entries by C, and I scale both the interest in W by C, and then I add them, I can factor the C out. Here I had one scalar and two vectors. What if I introduce a second scalar? So now I want a second scalar. I want to have some C plus D and multiply that by a vector. What does that come out to be? C times the vector plus D times the vector. It's a, another distributive property, but this time you can think we're distributing the vector over the scalars. And there's one more related, a kind of associative property, I suppose. If I have, I want to scale by C after having scaled by D, that's going to be the same as just scaling by C times D. 
if I stretch out a vector by a magnitude of two and I stretch it by a factor of three, that's the same as having to stretch it by a factor of six. And then the last thing I'll say is if you scale by one, well, it's not very interesting, right? You just get back to whatever your vector was. And so these are all properties of vectors. Now, I don't know if you ever wrote them down explicitly in your last linear algebra course, but you surely use them all the time, right? Maybe just intuitively, maybe at some point you, you thought about each of these facts, but certainly these are true for your vectors in R2. And not just in R2. You, you could change this all if you wanted to to Rn. And the exact same story would hold. All these facts are true in Rn. But why restrict ourselves to Rn? Maybe there are other kinds of mathematical objects out there that, that satisfy these properties. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define a vector space fancy V to be the thing that has these properties. A vector space V has vectors, u, v, w, whatever you want to call them, living inside a v, and scalars, like c and d, not necessarily living in r, but, but they should play the role of like numbers, but maybe they don't have to be real numbers, maybe, maybe they can be complex numbers, maybe they can be rational numbers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to denote here f, just, just to note any, any field. But if you're not familiar with the field, that's fine. Just, just think typically we mean by this something like R or C. In almost all of our examples, it'd be either the real numbers or the complex numbers. But it could be any field more generally. The rational numbers would also work, for example. And then we're going to say, OK, so a vector space is some set that has vectors and scalars that satisfy These properties, it is closed. The vector space is closed. You add two vectors in V, you get something else in V. The vectors commute, and they're associative, and there's a zero vector, and they're additive inverses, and there are scalars, not, not, in, uh, not, not giving you something in Rn, but giving you something in your vector space. It's distributive in these various ways, and multiplying by one just results in whatever vector you start out with. This means that whenever we talk about a field, a field needs to at least have a one inside of it, right? So, so whatever fields are, fields are things that have ones and they have zeros and they can have other kinds of things as well, like the real numbers, the complex numbers. You could actually have a field that only has zero and a one. That's, that's Z mod 2Z, that's a very simple field, but we're gonna work with just real and complex numbers for simplicity. Okay, so we're gonna say a vector space is anything that satisfies these kinds of things. So can you think of an example of a vector space other than Rn? What's something else that satisfies these properties? What are your vectors and what would be the scalars? some set of objects, so that if you take two of those objects, you can add them, and it's still in your set. Doesn't matter the order in which you add them. The addition's commutative. There's a zero object, whatever that object is, that when you add to something, you get the same thing. There are inverse objects. You can scale your objects and still get another object in your collection, and they follow these nice distributive properties. Can you think of another set of objects that could do this? Yeah. Uh, polynomials of order something. Oh, wonderful. Excellent. Let's, let's, here's our first example. Example. 
I'm going to denote it big P n. And by that, I'm going to mean the collection of collection of polynomials with order at most n. So like p2 will be everything up to the quadratics, right? Or p3 are things up to your cubics. Let's go through and check that this really satisfies the properties. If I take a polynomial and another polynomial and I add them together, what do I get? A polynomial, right? And if both those polynomials were at most order n, when you add them together, it's still at most order n, right? Take some like x squared plus 3x plus 2, add to it some 5x squared minus 6x minus 1, you're going to end up with some x squared thing, right? Some, some polynomial that's of order 2. Is addition commutative? Why? Well, it's going to boil down to the fact that when you add your polynomials, you're adding your coefficients. And since your coefficients are, I don't know, I'm assuming these are polynomials of real coefficients, maybe. Since real numbers are commutative, adding polynomials is also commutative. Same thing for associative property, right? When you add polynomials, you really just need to find the common uh, coefficients and add those. And as long as your coefficients are in some field that's, that's uh, associative, like the real numbers, then you're good. Is there a zero vector for us? What is it? Zero. Just zero, just the polynomial zero. Add zero to any polynomial, you get the same polynomial. Are there additive inverses? What is it? Yeah, you change the sign of all the coefficients of your polynomial. Can you scale polynomials? Yeah, so here we want to be a little bit careful. Where do our scalars live? Where do our C's and D's and these kinds of things live? Well, if by Pn we mean a collection of polynomials with order of most n with real values, with real valued coefficients, then we better not be trying to scale by a complex number, because then your real value coefficients would no longer be real value. Right? So you want to make sure that, that the field that your scalars are coming from are the same as, as whatever these polynomials are made up of. And so when I do this, we need to make sure that, that, the, that the scalars here, so, so with scalars also in R. Now, typically, when I want to denote where my scalars are coming from, the shorthand to do that when talking about vector spaces is we're just going to say the expression over R. Over is just saying over which scalar field, over which ground field for the scalars. Over R, R is the place where the scalars come from. So that's my shorthand for saying where scalars come from. So we have polynomials with real value coefficients up to degree n over R. It's working so far. Yeah, this still works. This still works. And you multiply a polynomial by 1, you get out back the polynomial. Seems like this is a pretty good example. So the set of polynomials can be made into a vector field or thought of as a vector field. Let's go even more broad. Why limit our attention to polynomials? What if we think about the complete collection, f, of real valued functions? So the set of functions that are taking you in some real number and spitting out some real number. Not just continuous, all of them. All real valued functions. All real valued functions. Where should our scalars be? This might be kind of weird. What, what, if you have two real value functions, can you add real valued functions? What does it mean to add real value functions? Yeah, how do we make sense of addition here? 
What do I mean by like F plus G? Well, we just remember if I F plus G of X, I mean, how do I define this? It's just going to be yeah, F of X plus G of X. So I'll just define the addition based upon what it does in every point, right? So, so like maybe F is like the, the times two function and G is like the plus one function. I enter like a five. Well, then you say five times two, five plus one, that's 10 and six added together at 16, right? So, so we can just define it based upon what it does on each element, on each X. So let's think. It seems like that gives you another real value function. Is it commutative? Yes. Why? Good. This f of x and this g of x are real value things. So the, these, these are real numbers. And so this is the same as g of x plus f of x. So that's the same as g plus f of x. So it's commutative. Associative? Yes. Exact same argument, the real number is associative, so so will these things be? What's the zero vector? The zero function, the really dumb function that sends every input to zero. So, so we have some zero uh, vector that's just whatever you put in, it spits out zero. Additive inverses? Yes. Yeah, you just define negative f. We define negative f to be the thing that puts out whatever negative of f of x is, right? You just have to give you the, the opposite values. Then when you add them up, you get zero every time, the zero vector. Scalars, where should your scalars live? Yeah, so this is a vector space over the set of reals. Again, if, you, if your scalars are like complex values and you multiply it by complex value, you're no longer getting out real values, right? So you better make sure your scalars are contained in the reals. And if you scale, uh, what does it mean to scale? What's like two times f of, of some x? Like what, what is that? I guess here I should have run minus f of x. What is two times f? Like, what is that function doing? Well, just two times whatever f of x is, right? Okay, this, this is not like hard and mysterious, it's just it's a new way to think about functions, to think that our functions are now vectors, right? We can distribute, that works out because real numbers satisfy these properties. These all work one times a real value function, which return the same function. Excellent, this works. Can you think of any more? Let's move on from functions. Functions were good, but let's try and think of some other kind of object. What is an object that you can add this with itself and you can scale this object? Matrices, excellent. By M, M, N, and, and I should say like where the values of the matrix are coming from. So I'll just stick with R for now, but you could have the values for something else. I mean the collection of M by N matrices with real valued entries. Each element of the matrix is some real number. Let's check that this works. If I add two m by n matrices, like a two by three and a two by three, what do I get? A two by three matrix, we can add matrices, that's well defined, as long as they're the same size. Is that addition commutative? Yeah, because you're just adding element wise, and those elements are just real numbers, and real numbers commute, so this works. Associative, exact same reasoning. Is there a zero vector here? What would it be? The matrix is all entries being zero. Inverses, just make all entries, change the sign. Can you scale a matrix? How? You scale all the entries, right? 
like two times the matrix is you just multiply every entry in the matrix by two. The distributed property holds. Yeah, again, this is going to hold because the entries are real valued, so this works. Oh, wait, careful. Where should our scalars come from? Good. If our matrix C has real values, make sure you're not scaling by like an I, because then you can get out a matrix that has imaginary values and it's no longer in the set of matrices that have real values. So you need to scale by something that's going to keep you inside of your set. You want to be closed under scaling. So this one would be over R. You could have a matrix with complex values, and then you could scale over the complex numbers if you wanted to. These work. One times the matrix is one. We're pretty good, right? OK. That's the entire set of matrices. Let's pick some, 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 some smaller sets. What if we don't want to do all the matrices with a smaller collection of matrices? Oh, let's think about invertible matrices. Great. So, so here, in order to even talk about inverses, they have to be a square matrix. So let's do invertible n by n matrices. Uh, again, let's just, for um, simplicity, keep it with real valued entries, right? OK, does this work? Well, let's just remind ourselves, it's been a while, perhaps, since you've done introduction to linear algebra. Invertible, what does that mean? There exists an inverse. When does there exist an inverse? When the determinant is non-zero. So, so this is the same thing as being non-singular, by which I just mean the determinant of your matrix is non-zero. Very good. So one of the big things you do in linear algebra is you come up with a collection of equivalent statements. And one of those big equivalencies is being invertible is equivalent to the determinant being non-zero. Right? And if you think back, you have some formula at some point where you find the, where you find the inverse and it involves dividing by the determinant, right? And the two by two case is very explicit, something similar in higher cases, but you can't divide by zero. So that's one way to remind yourself that to be invertible, your determinant must be non-zero. And that's an if and only if, it goes both ways. So let's check. If you add two invertible matrices, do you get an invertible matrix? Maybe it's less obvious, so let's think about it. Give me an example of an invertible matrix. Which one? I? OK. I'll just do a two by two case for simplicity. Is there anything you can add to that that's invertible that will break this? That will result in something that's not invertible? Ah. You might add this, and then what do you get? Now, it seems like, like this is really good. We have inverses of our matrices. We have a zero matrix. But what's the problem? This is not invertible. Both of these are invertible. If you calculate the determinant of either one, it's just one. So here our determinant for both of these is one, so they're invertible. But this guy, the determinant is zero, so it's non-invertible. That's a singular matrix. So it's not closed under addition. So it fails our first property. And hence, this is not a vector space. Good? OK. Well, maybe at this point, you might think it quite tedious to be going through, um, you know, always trying to check all of the properties. Especially in cases like this. Here, this was a subset. Here, S was some subset of V. And we wanted to check if S is a vector space. So, so my question is, is when is a subset of a vector space also a vector space? When is S also a vector space, if you know that your V was a vector space and you have some subset of it. The answer is when S satisfies all these properties. But some of these properties you get for free. So for example, if we come over here, if you know S lives inside of your bigger vector space, 
then since everything in that vector space commutes, everything in S has to commute as well. So you don't have to check this one. Does that make sense? Like we already know all matrices commute. So this would not break the fact that invertible matrices are not a vector space. You know, that, that, that didn't change the fact. It was the first property. Here's something we really have to check. Is the subspace closed? So, so let's put that on the list. One thing we need to check, one thing we really need to check is, is it closed? That is if I pick two elements inside of, inside of my subspace, V and W inside of my subspace, I want to know, is it true that their sum is also inside of my subspace? What's something else I need to check? Well, since all your vectors belong to the bigger space V and they all are associative, it'll still be associative when you just only pick vectors that happen to be inside of S. So this one you get for free. How about this one? Something to check here? Yeah, we want to check that the zero vector is actually inside of your subspace. Another reason invertible matrices are not a vector space is because zero is not an invertible matrix. And so it wouldn't live inside of S, and so it wouldn't make it a vector space. So we also need to check that it contains the zero, that zero is inside of, the zero vectors inside of your subspace. Additive inverses? Well, they exist somewhere in V, but you want to make sure your additive inverse is actually inside of S. So in this case, sure enough, you had his additive inverse. And actually, you always get additive inverses inside of the set, because multiplying by 1 keeps your determinant not 0. So that, that satisfies that property. But something you check every time. Additive inverses. Additive inverses. So we want to check that negative v is inside of your subspace. For every v in your subspace, negative v is also in your subspace. Maybe I can make that more precise. For every v in your subspace, it's additive inverse negative v is also inside of the subspace. Better be close to the scaling. If you scale your vector, you get something still in V, but you want to make sure you don't leave S, because you want S to be a vector space in its own right. So you want it to be closed under scaling. For every V in S, you want to make sure that scaling V still leaves you inside of S. Distributive? We get this for free. Since it's distributive inside of V, it'll still be distributive. The elements are still distributive in S because all the elements of S are elements of V. Similarly, we get these for free. So those are all fine. So it comes down to just, just one, two, three, four things we have to check. But I want you to make my life a little bit simpler. Instead of checking four things, are there any redundancies on this, on this list? Like if you know one of these, do other ones follow for free? Where does that come from? Or what does that give you? Or Scaling, great. If you can scale, you're thinking, then you can just scale by negative one. And therefore, if V is inside of there, so will negative V. OK, is there another argument like that you can do to get another one for free? What else could you scale by? You could scale by zero and get the zero vector. That is, it seems like if you know you can scale, then that automatically gives you zero in additive inverses. Hence, there would only be two things to check. To check that a subset of a vector space is itself a vector space, you need to check that that subset is closed under addition and closed under scaling. Because if you can scale, you can multiply by zero and get the zero vectors. So you know the zero vectors in there. And if you can scale and stay inside of S, you can scale by negative one, and you know negative V is also inside of there. Almost true. It is true. Not justified yet. You're making a critical assumption. 
you're assuming two things. First, you're assuming that multiplying by negative 1 will always give you the additive inverse. And second, you're assuming that that scaling by 0 will always give you the 0 vector. And like, yes, that's true in R2, but, you know, we haven't said that in these properties. And so here are two big assumptions you're making. The good news is these assumptions are true. Let's prove them. Theorem, our first theorem of the course. From just these properties of vectors, you can think about these as being the axioms of vectors, we're going to prove two properties. First, whenever you scale by negative 1, you get the additive inverse. And second, whenever you multiply by 0, you get the 0 vector. OK, here we go. Let, let, me, let me number these. Maybe 1 and 2. Proof. Let's prove the second one first. I want to start with this thing and end up with the zero vector. How? These are the tools I have. Well, let's make use of this zero vector property. I can add zero to anything and it remains the same. That is, zero times the vector v is the same as zero times the vector v plus the zero vector. Happy with that? Now, now what we really want is just this guy by himself. But we're getting there. OK. We at least have the zero vector on the board now. What can we say about the zero vector? Let's go back to our properties. Ah, here's one. The zero vector is the same thing as something plus its additive inverse. So let me rewrite that zero vector here as this guy plus his additive inverse. Uh, one more. Be happy so far? I've used the fact that I can just add the zero vector, doesn't change it. And the zero vector is the same as anything plus its additive inverse. Now, now what can we do? I have a lot of parentheses on the board. Do I have something that helps me with parentheses? A social property. Instead of having these parentheses here, I can move this to here. Oh, there are coefficient scalars in front of both these vectors. What can I do? My distributive property. Again, since I have a zero in front of both these guys, I can pull that zero out. This is the same as zero plus zero times v, right? That's my distributive property. For us, it was listed as property number 8, plus the additive inverse of 0 times v. Now, 0 is just a real number here. You know what 0 plus 0 is. Don't pretend like you don't. What is 0 plus 0? 0. So th this is just 0 times v plus the additive inverse of 0 times v. And what is something plus its additive inverse? The 0 vector. So our intuition is right. In any vector space, 0 times the a vector returns the 0 vector. Now that might seem quite messy. But we want to make sure we're no longer relying on intuition. We're no longer thinking about what happens in R2. We're just saying, what can we get from these rules? 
Intuition might help you suggest a proposition, but we can only prove it using our properties of our vector space. Okay, the, the second proof is, is, is very similar for this guy. Uh, let me just do it in one minute. So for, for uh, the proof of part one, uh, all, all we want to do is we say, okay, now we have that the zero vector is the same thing as zero times a vector, but zero is the same thing as one minus one. But the biodistributive property, that gives you one times a vector minus one times the vector. But we have by property 10 that one times a vector is just V. So we have V minus one times a vector gives you zero. Hence, one times the vector is playing the role of the additive inverse. A vector plus negative one times the vector returns zero. Hence, negative one times the vector really is just the additive inverse of the vector. Okay, so we gotta stop and think, what are we really trying to prove? To prove this, you usually wanna show that times by one gives you the additive inverse, and that's, that's what we found. We'll stop here for today.